Good morning and welcome to the Pearls 2105, a New York Latinx culture and the arts, West Side Story, the Brooklyn Connection lecture series. Uh, please note that this is being recorded um, and uh, note also that this is National Hispanic or Latinx Heritage Month. And so uh, in light of that, we have uh, a very special guest and a very special session. So thank you for joining us. Welcome, bienvenidos, bienvenidas, bienvenides. I am Dr. Maria Perez y Gonzalez. I am the deputy chairperson of the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, or as we call it, PEARLS. Uh, I consider that Brooklyn College is a treasure box and we are the pearls of that treasure box. Um, the students from 2105 are here. And so just a note for them, please direct message me with your name for attendance. Um, and I wanna begin by saying that uh, we acknowledge that this is the unceded territory of the Lenape indigenous peoples. We need to learn about and commit ourselves to beginning the process of dismantling ongoing legacies of settler colonialism and to recognize the hundreds of indigenous nations who continue to resist, live, and uphold their sacred relations across their lands. So it is with pleasure that this lecture series is presented. It's unique. Uh, and so it's very special. So the Department of Pearls is offering this course as part of general education, the uh, intercultural competency rubric. Uh, the focus is West Side Story. Uh, which I am teaching, um, and the centerpiece of the course is the lecture series. Dr. Sanchez Coral, um, who I will introduce shortly, made this possible. Uh, alongside the generosity of the speakers, taking their time, their talents, and sharing them with us during these series. This course centers the 10 time Academy Award winning film from 1961 as connected to the forthcoming December 2021 release of the version produced by Steven Spielberg, Tony Kushner, our guest today, Christy McCosco-Krieger, Kevin McConnell, and Rita Moreno. Our course explores the artistic and cultural impact of West Side Story through the lenses of the humanities and social sciences, highlighting topics of Puerto Rico's history with the United States, immigration, ethno-racial relations, gender, gangs, language, music, uh, character analysis, et cetera. Uh, Professor Emerita of Pearls and recipient of the 2020 Herbert H. Lee Lehman Prize for Distinguished Service in New York History, Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral, uh, served as historical consultant uh, to West Side Story, the forthcoming one. Together, uh, we've organized a lecture series of special guests connected to the film to share expertise, experiences, and insight for students as they move through the socio-historic background and artistry of West Side Story. Uh, she is my co-host, uh, and she was long-term chair of the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies from 1989 to 2004. Uh, and among her many other activities and honors and publications, et cetera, she was the founding president of the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Uh, as consultant to West Side Story, um, she is, in addition to that, she is also um, co-editing a book, which we both partnered together to do, to produce, um, entitled Puerto Rican Studies in the City University of New York. And so I'm going to uh, just take a moment to show you a beautiful cover because we just got permission to release it. Um, and so I'm going to share this with you just for a moment. And so uh, it is entitled the book uh, Puerto Rican Studies in the City University of New York, the first 50 years that we edited. We have numerous wonderful, prestigious authors in it, prominent people who have been activists and students in CUNY. But basically, it tells the story of the student struggle, the activist struggle for equity and justice and representation in the university setting. And so we're really proud of this cover uh, done by Carmen Iris Santiago. And so uh, the book should come out in November. So we hope you get a copy of it, get a hold of it, and look more closely at the beautiful cover. 
And so with that, um, let me now uh, say to you, thank you for joining us once again. Uh, thank you for all who have joined us. We have uh, various people here. I can't see you all, but there are many people who love West Side Story joining us. There are many people who love Tony Kushner who's joining us uh, and many people who are just so interested in celebrating with us this special time and this wonderful opportunity. Um, if you have any questions, I will be um, looking at the chat. So please feel free to write your questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral and I will be um, having a conversation with Mr. Kushner. And so um, I will every so often pick up your questions and, and state them um, for Mr. Kushner to respond to. And so uh, one more thing I'd like to point out uh, before I introduce Mr. Kushner is that our next session is on October 13th. And we will have Dr. Ernesto Acevedo Munoz, who's also with us today uh, in the audience. Um, and he's going to be speaking about making an American masterpiece and casting in particular. So uh, we look forward to that. Join us, please. I will put the West Side Story lecture series link in the chat in a few moments. Uh, but for now, it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce someone that many of you already know, but uh, born in New York City, just as West Side Story emerged on the Broadway stage, Mr. Tony Kushner's plays include Angels in America, A Gay Fantasia on National Themes, Homebody, Kabul, Kabul, and The Intelligent Homosexual's Guide to Capitalism and Socialism with a Key to the Scriptures. He wrote the screenplay for Mike Nichols' film version of Angels in America, and the screenplays for Steven Spielberg's films, Munich, Lincoln, and now West Side Story, opening this December. Mr. Kushner is the recipient of a Pulitzer Prize for drama, an Emmy, two Tony Awards, three Obie Awards, an Olivier Award, two Oscar nominations, an Arts Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Spirit of Justice Award from the Gay and Lesbian Advocates and Defenders, a Cultural Achievement Award from the National Foundation for Jewish Culture, a National Medal of Arts awarded by President Barack Obama, the Lifetime Achievement in the American Theater Award, and the Steinberg Distinguished Playwright Award, including a CUNY Honorary Doctorate degree bestowed by John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And I was actually there when they gave it to him in the audience. My niece graduated that year from John Jay College. Um, and uh, that is my alma mater as well. And so uh, I was there to hear that wonderful speech that you gave, Mr. Kushner. Uh, so among these many honors, uh, those are the ones that I, we highlighted today. Uh, and he lives in Manhattan with his husband, Mark Harris, who himself is an accomplished writer. So um, uh, now I will introduce Dr. Virginia Sanchez Coral, who will begin our conversation with Mr. Kushner. Unless Mr. Kushner, would you like to uh, say a few words before uh, we pass it along to a conversation? No, I'm just that I'm I'm happy and honored uh, to be here, and I'm I'm uh, excited about the course on uh, West Side Story, and uh, I look forward to uh, being able to. I'm in the middle of filming right now, so I had to miss Bobby's session, although I've read a transcript of it, and uh, I look forward to seeing uh, the other sessions as well because I think it's uh, a great um, cultural artifact around which to center. Uh, an examination of a number of important issues. So I'm happy to be a part of the process and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us. And Virginia? I'm on, and I'm on. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm delighted that you could join us today. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting session as are all of the sessions in the lecture series. And, um, and I think we should just uh, jump right in and begin. So, uh, Mr. Kushner, may I call you Tony? Yeah, you I, always I, have. I, yes. I always have, so I might as well continue. Um, uh, so, uh, Mr. Kushner has, uh, has kindly given us his time today. Uh, he has left the monkey on the set, uh, who, is, who is filming. Uh, a very, very important monkey if he can film. But um, uh, there are a number of questions that have been coming up throughout the series so far. We, we've already had three sessions. And um, 
And so I, I, I thought maybe we could talk about some of the things that keep reappearing uh, on the chats. And um, well, one of the first, first things that I would want to know is um, what, what drove you to do a new version of West Side Story? Uh, I imagine, how did you feel when, did Steven present the, did Steven Spielberg present the idea to you? Uh, uh, what, what, what drove you to do that? Sure. Um, uh, we finished filming uh, Lincoln in 2011, I think, and it opened in the fall of 2012. I think that's right. Or two, yeah, 2012, 2013. I, I can never remember which year it was. Um, right after Lincoln opened, uh, Stephen and I were already working on another uh, project um, about the kidnapping of a Jewish child by the Vatican in uh, Italy in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and uh, uh, we were struggling with the story. It was a complicated story to tell. Um, and then one day he called me and asked me to come and have breakfast with him. He was in New York. And we were met in a restaurant in, uh, back in the day when you could actually meet in restaurants. And uh, yeah. he said that he wanted to talk to me about uh, uh, something that he'd always wanted to do. Uh, uh, he wanted to make a movie musical and he wanted to do West Side Story. And uh, I pretended to be fascinated and then I went home to Mark and said, okay, he's lost his mind and he wants to <laughs> make a West Side Story and why would you do that? Um, and, and, you know, there are so many obstacles and problems that one would face doing that, including the enormously formidable shadow cast by the 1961 film. Um, and then Stephen and I talked about it for a while. And I mean, I've always really loved the musical. Uh, I think the score is probably the most perfect to the extent that the word perfect should ever be really used for a work of art, but uh, it's probably the most perfect score um, for a Broadway musical, for an American musical theater piece in the sense that it, uh, every song is great. Um, every song has become a kind of classic. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and it's an enormously powerful um, show and, and it was made into an incredibly powerful film. I mean, I've seen it several times. I cry at the end of uh, the movie every time. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was appealing on that. I come from a family of classical musicians, but my parents were uh, professional musicians. Um, so Leonard Bernstein was a kind of god in our house when I was growing up. My mother actually played with him. My brother, who now lives in Vienna and is a horn player, uh, has been connected by him. Uh, <clears throat> so he's a, a very important figure in my life. And uh, I revere Stephen Sondheim. I met Arthur Lawrence on several occasions. So I knew a lot of the people involved, the Bernstein kids um, I've known for a while. Uh, and um, I was very moved by what Stephen uh, was talking about when he was talking about wanting to remake it uh, or to make a, a new movie based on the um, Broadway original. I, I uh, like Stephen, I was very attracted to um, the politics of West Side Story, this, uh, that it's a, a, a cry against xenophobia and um, uh, uh, racial hatred um, and uh, that it's an actual tragedy as opposed to a very sad musical because Rodgers and Hammerstein had done really great, very sad musicals, but the guys that put together West Side Story really wanted to make a tragedy. And I thought that was an intriguing thing. And I think they actually succeeded. I, I love Shakespeare, of course. So I love Romeo and Juliet and I love the ways that they riff on Romeo and Juliet and also the ways that the musical differs from Romeo and Juliet. Um, in some ways more than I think that the creators actually knew they were doing um, or, or fully realized they were doing. Um, so it got exciting to me. And we talked about the um, raising of uh, the neighborhoods of Lincoln Square and San Juan Hill uh, to make way for Lincoln Center um, that were uh, the settings of the um, you can see uh, fragments of that in the in the 1961 film, um, and I began to read a lot about the, the sort of violent gentrification 
and the um, uh, dislocation of, of the communities of that area, including the Puerto Rican community that was, I think, largely centered in San Juan Hill, um, the sort of uh, upper part of, of the west side area uh, that where West Side Square takes place. Um, and uh, I, the more I began to think about the musical, the more I began to uh, look at the differences between the movie and the original, uh, the more excited I became. And I said, yes, and, uh, and started working on um, figuring out how to uh, do a new realization of the story. Wow. Uh, I would never have done this without Stephen asking me to do it. I, I would never have written a movie about Abraham Lincoln without Stephen asking me. I mean, these are in some ways serendipitous things. It was not, um, I love musicals very much, but I would never have uh, felt a great, I didn't have a great need to uh, investigate West Side Story as I wound up doing, but I'm very glad I did. Uh, in terms of, you know, I know that you're very, very much um, concerned about authenticity and representation. And, um, and here you are about to take on this, this enormous role of, uh, of, of making a new version of a film uh, based on the, the original play, uh, the 1961 film, which um, uh, from from my interviews and my my research and talking to my colleagues, I, I realized that uh, that the, the the first the first sentiments about the film from our community were very positive. My generation was very very positive about it because of um, it was the first time that we ever saw ourselves as main characters in a major film. And uh, we knew that there were problems, but we disregarded that because when you're invisible for so long to suddenly have a crack at being visible, at being alive, at, being, at having a, 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 a story to tell was very intriguing. A lot, of the, uh, a lot of the criticism in the film doesn't really come about until, oh my goodness, years later, 10, 15 years later when uh, Puerto Rican studies is established and we begin to produce literature, uh, analytical and critical and, uh, and, and uh, uh, political really, that we begin to see all of these, uh, uh, all of the arguments about it. So for you to come and take on this task is really commendable. And, and so I wonder how do you given your, your concerns about politics and representation and authenticity, how do you inhabit a culture that is not your own in a yeah. movie like this? I mean, the politics of representation are very important to me. I'm a gay Jewish man. Um, and I, uh, so obviously I have a, a, a stake in, in, you know, whatever we're referring to when we talk about the politics of identity, but I, I believe that I'm, I'm also, uh, I would call myself a Marxist. I would call my, you know, I, um, I believe in economic justice as well as social justice. I guess that's what I mean when I say I'm a Marxist, but uh, um, I, I, I believe that, that the politics of identity in a democracy especially have an enormously important uh, function. Um, Authenticity is a complicated word. I don't know if I, I, I feel nervous about doing that because I'm an artist, I make art, which means I sort of lie for a living. So, you know, I make up people um, or I, I take people that other people have made up and I remake them. But it, it's, it's uh, I, I feel like my job as an artist is to look for the truth about things. And, and um, I think that what we talk about when we talk about authenticity is certainly involved in the truth. Um, but I think that there's a, very, a slightly different kind of authenticity, for instance, if you're making a documentary than if you're making uh, a, a work of fiction. And so I'm a little bit, I just want to sort of put an asterisk next to the word authenticity. I'm not entirely comfortable with that. I can't claim an authentic knowledge in the sense of uh, an innate um, um, inherited knowledge of Puerto Rican culture. Obviously, I'm not Puerto Rican. Um, I don't speak Spanish. Um, 
uh, so there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. Um, how did you, if, if, if you don't mind, sure. how did you work with that? How did you then try to be as real as possible, right? To, yeah. To um, I mean, you know, sort of by ordinary boring uh, things that everybody does. Uh, I, I read a lot. I, I always read a great deal when I'm working on a project. I knew that the biggest of the many things that uh, I didn't know when I started working on West Side Story, the biggest thing, the biggest gap in my knowledge was specifically Puerto Rican and New Rican history. Um, so I did what I always do. I started buying a lot of books um, and, and reading a lot. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I was, I have to say, uh, mortified at, at how little I knew. I mean, I'm a fairly educated person. Uh, and I'm a person of the left, and I certainly know some things. I knew some things going into this about Puerto Rican history, but um, uh, taking a kind of a, a dilettante deep dive in, I mean, a dilettante as opposed to a scholar. Um, I can't, I'm not a scholar, which means you have a lifelong relationship to a specific body of knowledge. I don't have that with any of the things that I write about. But, but in, the, in the couple of years that I spent, you know, working on sort of the preliminary period to beginning the screenplay and reading a lot of stuff about uh, a lot of essays and, and histories of Puerto Rico, I realized, you know, how much I didn't know, how much has been disappeared. I mean, it's it, even for a fairly educated person, um, things, things that uh, happened even in my lifetime that involved, you know, uh, Puerto Rico, um, I was unaware of, and, and that was um, shocking to me and also exciting to me because I was learning something that, uh, I mean, that's one of the thrills of doing what I do is you get to understand things you don't, don't understand. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, in addition to doing a lot of research, um, one of the great uh, sort of luxuries of being a playwright or a screenwriter is that you know that you're moving towards a period of collaboration. So if I write an African-American character or a Puerto Rican character or in my play Humbody Cabo, which I wrote in 1997 before the towers fell and people weren't thinking so much about Afghanistan, I went to Queens and, and met with um, Afghan people who were living in, in, in what they call little cobble in Queens. Uh, and then when we uh, did the play Homebody Cobble or my musical Carolina Change, which is uh, the starring role in that is, a, is an African-American woman, a black woman um, in the deep South where I grew up. Uh, I know that I'm gonna work with directors and I'm gonna work with actors who um, have a, a, a lived connection to uh, the kind of cultures that I'm writing about. And if I'm open to discussion and collaboration, um, I can fix things that I got wrong. Um, and and uh, so that by the time it, uh, whatever I'm doing reaches an audience, I have a faith that if everybody works really, really hard, we'll have gotten a lot of things right, not everything. Um, and, uh, and, and so far in my life, I think that that's been proven correct. I, I feel like I haven't made, in terms of uh, looking at, at other uh, cultures other than my own, that I haven't made um, terrible mistakes. And I think that's partly because I do a lot of work myself, but also because I'm uh, eager to collaborate with people who know things that I don't know. Um, so, um, I mean, I learned uh, all sorts of things, including how, you know, from, from the first guy that I um, uh, work with on, on translating the Spanish, I put all the Spanish, I don't speak Spanish, so I, I wanted there to be a lot of Spanish in the movie, um, and I didn't want it to be subtitled, I wanted it to be, if you speak Spanish and English, you'll understand the whole movie, if you only speak Spanish, you'll understand the Spanish lines, if you only speak English, you're not going to understand the Spanish lines, but you'll you know, and, and, you know, welcome to the United States. It's like, we're a bilingual country now. Um, and, uh, but I don't speak it. So I did a lot of Google translation just to sort of, so when Stephen read the script, he would see 
Spanish there. Um, he doesn't speak Spanish either, and he'd know that this is Spanish. Um, and uh, and then I began to work with uh, Julio Mange, who is Puerto Rican, um, mm -hmm. who's a friend of mine and a, a dancer and a, a actor uh, and a writer. And and he translated did the first translation into Spanish. And while he was translating it, he was pointing out all sorts of things like. Uh, I forget exactly how, what I had written, but he explained to me that, that there's a Puerto Rican way of making coffee that um, I think it wound up getting cut out of the script. But uh, so we, I changed the script in many ways uh, just based on my uh, preliminary conversations with Julio. And, uh, and then, you know, when we began filming and, and um, a lot of Puerto Rican actors uh, came on board and Virginia came on board and um, mm -hmm. talked to Bobby Sanabria and people like that, I, I, you know, I learned other things and, and little changes got made all along the way. And yeah. uh, so that's how I feel like I get uh, as close as I can get to a truth. I mean, obviously Stephen and I both very, very much want uh, if, a, if a person, a New Yorkian person or a Puerto Rican person sees the movie, um, it, it, it is enormously important to both of us that, um, that the Puerto Rican characters seem familiar and seem identifiable and seem true um, in, in, uh, in the ways that to each of those, uh, to each person uh, feels like a true representation. Um, I, I am interested though, like, I think that one of the great things about art uh, is that it allows us to have an insight into how people imagine the other. And I think that that's a very, uh, I think that in, in a lot of the discussion that's happening now about authenticity and the politics of identification and who gets to tell which story, um, you know, as a Jew, it's, it's, uh, it's of enormous importance to me that I know now how Shakespeare imagined Jews or that I know how George Eliot imagined Jews or Charles Dickens imagined Jews. Um, they are each succeeded or failed to uh, uh, varying degrees, but it, uh, it tells me something about the dominant culture imagining um, a culture that is in some ways oppressed um, it tells me something about the capacity for empathy uh, to cross boundaries. Um, it tells us about both the universality of humanity and also its specificity. Um, and I think that those are important things that we get from a work of art. So I don't want people to go to see West Side Story and forget that it was written, the screenplay in this instance was written by a gay Jew as the original book for the musical was written by a gay Jew. <laughs> I think that it's important to, to know that you're, you know, we don't watch things innocently or we shouldn't. You should never encounter any work of art innocently like, oh, this is supposed to be the truth. I'm watching reality. You're not, you're watching a work of art and you engage with it in a, in a critical, complicated way. So that's a long answer to that question. <laughs> I, I, we, I, I can, I can, uh, I, th I think I could speak for the people that you've mentioned and say that we're very, very glad that you moved away from the Google translations. <laughs> that was, that, yes, that, that, was, that made us, that made us particularly, particularly happy. Um, we made a mistake and, when we first, when we first asked Rita Moreno to be part of this film. Um, I was in the middle of working on uh, the retranslations with Julio but they weren't done. So somebody sent her the screenplay with the Google Spanish, which is like basically gibberish. And mm -hmm. she, her first comment to Stephen was, what in the hell is this? I mean, she was like completely <laughs> confused. Like this is not Spanish. Yeah. 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 Um, I, think, I think there was another point in, 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 in trying to, uh, to, to, to be true, to, to be authentic. Uh, and that was that uh, we, we really didn't realize that there was a generational gap, that the 1957 uh, 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 Puerto Rican Spanish in New York uh, had a different vocabulary, or there were things that were very familiar to us that were not familiar to the younger people 
uh, who were uh, in the crew or, uh, or in the cast. And I found that to be particularly uh, important uh, because the film is very, very true to the 1950s. Did I say 97? I probably did. 1957 play. Uh, yeah. And the language as it was spoken then uh, and, and is now going to be seen by an audience in 2021 who is totally, well, they, would, they can't ask their parents. They would have to ask their grandparents uh, what, was, what was the community like then? You know, what right. were the key terms? What did people say? And I think you got that. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we, uh, which, which turned out to be yeah, a fun I mean, thing. Yeah, after Julio and I finished the first like two or three passes with the Spanish um, uh, and we moved into production, um, I asked uh, Victor Sanchez, who was a, a, one of the dialect coaches and he was Puerto Rican, to identify six of the uh, cast members who were playing, um, you know, people in the Puerto Rican people in the, in the movie who were from Puerto Rico. And we sort of made a, a what we call the Puerto Rican sort of Talmudic study group, and we 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 met several times while we were filming, and we went over every line of Spanish, and and they were all very young. I mean, they're all in the like early twenties. Um, some of them were people from the island, and some of them were people who grew up in New York but who speak Spanish, and and there were long, really complicated discussions about would she say this or would she say it this way. And then people like going right. off with their cell phones to call their grandmothers and say, how would you have said this? And right. It, right. it was an yeah. uh, amazing, uh, a long debate about lahara, the word lahara, whether lahara. it meant remember that? Yeah. Lahara, uh, whether it meant a, a, a cop or a cop car or a sign, you know, yeah. and then and yeah. somebody, the origin of the word that it's from uh, apparently uh, the Irish predominance in the New York City police force, it was O'Hara, it was turned into O'Hara, anyway. So we, we really dug deep into it. And I, I think that that, I hope that's reflected in the film. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, I have one other question before, before I know Maria wants to ask you something too. And um, uh, let's talk about the women. Uh, some of the comments have been that uh, in the 1961 film, uh, not so much the play, but the 1951, uh, 61 film, um, that, uh, that, that, that women, the role of women is really very placid. There is no agency. Uh, these are not strong women. Uh, and again, with the 2021 film, uh, we encountered that same thing. I remember, you know, we had a lot of conversations about the role of women then and how they would be portrayed in the film. And, uh, and you made some interesting comments about Shakespeare's women. So I was wondering if maybe you'd want to say something about that because uh, that was a very interesting uh, point of view. Uh, are there, are the women in, in the 2021 film strong women? Do they have agency? Oh, yeah. Do they act on their own? Were they like that in the 1961 film? Uh, is there a change in the way that you have written the screenplay to reflect the change? Sure. I mean, I would argue about yeah. the 61 film or the 57 musical, stage musical, that, that the women are all passive. I don't think that Anita certainly is a passive figure at all. Um, I mean, she's very uh, tough-minded. Um, she knows what she wants. She knows where she wants to be. She's very much in love with Bernardo, but she is not interested in, Bernardo has decided that he, well, in the, in the stage, in the original stage musical, it's, a, it's yeah. another uh, Puerto Rican woman um, who is, uh, uh, has decided that she really want, is sick of New York. And then in the movie, they, when they changed America, the song America, the, the debate becomes between the men and the women. The women, I, I don't feel that it's entirely fair to say that the women are all weak. Maria, in the movie especially, is um, in the 61 film, um, you know, I think you're, you're seeing two things. One is, a, is a, uh, maybe a cliched assumption about uh, um, uh, young women in, in Catholic cultures or in, in Latin American cultures and Puerto Rican cultures 
that that they're that they're uh, kept in a sort of cloistered and secluded from the world, and so she's a little bit of a of a shrinking violet at first. But if you watch the sixty one film carefully, uh, she turns um, over the course of the of the film mm -hmm. like any tragic heroine in an opera. She grows into a kind of majestic figure. So at the end, there's nothing weak about her at all. She's. I had some issues with the idea of somebody going through a horrible tragedy as a kind of growth process. I mean, I think sometimes people do grow through tragedy, but tragedy is not a good thing for the most part. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. it, loss and death and violence are not uh, you know growth opportunities um, primarily. So I think I made our, our Maria. Um, I mean, she's definitely not a weak person. She's a, she's very strong. She she is a person who knows. She's very much her brother's sister. I mean, they're both people with very strong opinions and wills, and they're uh, and they 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 are at odds with each other almost from from the beginning. Uh, Maria and Bernardo. Um, and uh, again, Anita, I think, has never been a particularly placid or, or you know. Um, I mean, Virginia, when you came to speak to, the, the first thing we did on the first day of rehearsal was to have a group of uh, Puerto Rican activists and scholars, including Virginia, uh, speak to the cast. And, and Virginia said this thing was enormously important, which is that uh, the, the ways in which West Side Story is a sort of a feminist musical uh, is, is something that's under considered. And I think it's true. The, you know, we, we always think of it as being the Jets versus the Sharks, uh, just as Romeo and Juliet is sort of the Montagues versus the Capulets. But one of the many ways in which Lawrence and Sondheim and Bernstein and Robbins changed the story and from Shakespeare is it's not actually the Jets versus the shark, Sharks. It's kind of the, the, the white boys versus the Puerto Rican women. I mean, it's it's the the main characters on the white side of things are men. The main characters, except for Bernardo, on the Puerto Rican side are the women. Um, uh, if you if you just look at the uh, amount of stage time or screen time in '61 that the Sharks are given versus the Jets, you have to say the Jets get much more screen time. But if you look at the screen time that the Jets have. Um, and then the, the Puerto Rican women are given, it's not 50-50, but it becomes closer to a kind of, uh, I think it's like 64, I count, so did it a percentage myself, it comes closer about 60-40. Um, so it's, uh, I think that there's an interesting, um, you know, and, and again, I mean, these are four gay men writing this thing in, in 1957, and I think that it's, you know, inarguably true that gay men, Tennessee Williams, for instance, uh, allowed women characters more time on stage and, and, and because they couldn't represent themselves, they couldn't put gay characters on stage, they found a way to uh, um, express the things that they wanted to express about their own lives through the lives of women, which is a problematic thing, but it also created, you know, Blanche Dubois mm -hmm. and a host of uh, really extraordinary female characters, right. and I think, including Maria and and uh, Anita, um, the Shakespeare connection, of course, is that Juliet is an enormously strong. I mean, she's thirteen years old, but she is a powerhouse. She's much stronger and smarter and on top of things than Romeo, and she really sort of drives the play. I mean, if you see somebody, it's so hard to to cast that role because you need somebody very young. And she has to do incredibly difficult things on stage, but she, she is really the driving force. She's the thing that that propels the story forward. She's the person who makes the decisions. She's you know she's a woman in in medieval Italy um, and and defies her father in a kind of shocking ways. I mean you know takes poison. I mean dr drugs herself to look like she's committed suicide. So that she can be with Romeo. I mean, it's she, like most teenage girls; she's formidable, and uh, and Shakespeare got that right. I mean, he's really amazing. The same thing is true with Desdemona and Othello. He did not 
sentimentalize or Victorianize. I mean, of course, he wouldn't have done that, but he didn't sentimentalize um, young women. One thing that Desdemona and Juliet have in common is they both have very powerful libidos. They're, they're sexual beings and they have strong fantasies and their fantasies are not hearts and flowers and, you know, uh, you know, ooey gooey stuff. Uh, Desdemona falls in love with Othello because he tells her these stories about these bizarre countries that he's been to and these battles he's fought. And she's turned on by that. She likes that. And, you know, Juliet is very intrigued by the idea of waking up. I mean, she's frightened of the idea of waking up in a crypt. She's also a little bit gothic. I mean, she kind of in, into the idea. I mean, so they're mm -hmm. complicated beings. And I think that that's, yeah. I think that's in West Side Story as well. And I, I, I feel very proud of the way that we brought that forward and Virginia were a big help with that. Um, <laughs> bringing that forward in the, in, the, in the film. I don't think anybody will watch this and think, oh, all the women are weak. They won't. Maria? Yeah, yeah I, I, this past Sunday were the, uh, the Tony Awards. And so I'm gonna head in that direction as linked to what you've been saying. Um, director Kenny Leon, right, who previously won a Tony for August Wilson's Fences play on Broadway and which you um, later wrote the screenplay for the film adaptation in 2016, uh, starring Viola Davis and Denzel Washington. He mentioned during his acceptance speech at the Tony Awards that the table has to get bigger. And so I know that with us, there are many writers and students of creative writing. And, you know, um, many of us have no clue uh, <laughs> about how to make that table bigger, how to join that table, how to be invited to that table. Um, and then we had also, also Matthew Lopez uh, of Puerto Rican. He indicated during the same show that by winning the Tony for best play for The Inheritance, he became the first Latine writer to get the award in its 74 history. Right. So um, what advice or strategies would you give specifically to Latinx, you know, people of color uh, writers who are interested in being at the table? I mean, they are and they are gifted and talented uh, and want to contribute to Broadway and the film industry with their creative writing and artistic talents. What advice do you have for them? How can they do that? Right. Usually you have networks. If you don't have any to begin with, what is your advice? How do you create that? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, I've, I've uh, made four movies and they've all been with the same director. <laughs> um, so I have a very weird uh, understanding of the film industry. I, uh, it's, it's very particular. I mean, I, Stephen asked me to, you know, with Munich uh, uh, to try and write a, a screenplay about the murder of the Israeli uh, uh, athletes at the Munich Olympic Games in 72. I, um, and that just sort of started me in this collaboration with him, which is now, I think I've written more movies for him. I'm, I'm here in this trailer in LA making our fourth movie together. Um, so I think I've written more screenplays for him than anybody else, which is weird. Um, it's just a very good collaboration. So I have a, I don't really know very much, I have to say, about how you break into film for anybody, I never really know what advice to give. It's a strict, I don't understand. Uh, uh, there's a lot about the film industry I don't understand. I understand a lot about theater. I'm a playwright. Um, I think it's a very, very good time. And I would imagine this is true in film as well as, as theater. This is a good time uh, if you're a, a writer of color, if you're uh, from a community that uh, is not um, often heard from, uh, where your voice is underrepresented, I think that there is a real interest right now in in um, a course correction in a in a in um, among white people of an unlearning of privilege, which is not an easy thing uh, ever for people to do, uh, a surrendering of privilege, um, and uh, and I think an awareness of the necessity of, um, I think you put it really well, it's, it's uh, maybe it was Kenny Leon who said it, but that, that, that we need to um, think about ways that we can make room at the table. I mean, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this since, uh, uh, I mean, George Floyd's murder, but also earlier than that. But I mean, in the, in the, in the wake of the, the sort of, um, 
this new sort of national focus on uh, questions of, of representation um, in culture. Um, is it, is, am I sure that I would um, have said yes to doing West Side Story um, in, if he had asked me in 2019 as opposed to, or 2020 as opposed to 2014? I don't know the answer to that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I know that I would not have said uh, no to it because I think I have no right. I don't even like using the language of rights when you talk about um, creating works of art, I, I, I would not have said no to it because uh, it's wrong for me to write a Puerto Rican character. I absolutely reject that idea. Um, but, and I think it's important to keep these things as separate as we can. There are issues of economics and of employment opportunity. Um, I, um, and I'm an old white guy. <laughs> And so I have to figure out, and I'm really am grappling with this now. So what do I, how do I make room? How do I make sure that I'm not taking something that somebody um, who would not ordinarily have the chance to do this, uh, uh, to work on a specific project? Um, uh, you know, how, how do I make sure that I'm not taking something from Matthew Lopez, let's say, for instance. Um, it's a, you know, it's, and that's a complicated thing. And I'm genuinely struggling with that. I, I, I feel like because of the streaming services revolution, the digital revolution, there's so much content being made now mm -hmm. um, that I can almost say with film and television, what I would always say to any playwright, if you write a wonderful play, I believe it's almost impossible that it won't get produced. Wonderful plays come along like two or three a year at best, um, or 10 a year in the whole country. If you write something really good, if you write something that's really dramatic and stage worthy, um, I think that you will absolutely be able to find a way to get it produced. You will find people in the theater, in the nonprofit theater world, who will be interested in um, reading it and, in, and if it's good, in, in moving it forward. I think there's a real appetite among theater audiences for understanding uh, the lived experiences of people other than you know upper middle-class white people or rich white people. I mean, I think that there's a real interest in, in uh, um, this, the theater uh, and also maybe at this point now in film and television as well, reflecting our multicultural democracy rather than in continuing to reproduce a lie that this is a white country uh, with only white stories to tell. Um, and I think that this is a good moment for it. And uh, you know, there are also, the, I mean, if I was talking to anybody one-on-one -on -one and, and maybe we can arrange something like that um, for people who really want just like career counseling, as, as much as I know about career, I mean, my second play was a big hit, Angels in America. so. I had a kind of an anomalous career in that regard. But there are things that I know that I could certainly share about how you reach out to theaters, who you make contact with, what theaters are the good theaters to go to and so on. Um, and probably if I thought about it with film and television too, there are some things to, that I could suggest. Um, but I would imagine most people in the audience today are also young, so you understand far better than I do things like the internet and I mean, I have no social media presence and there's networking that can be done through that as well. There are a number of really extraordinary artists like Michaela Cole, who my understanding is uh, um, started out using the web, the internet to get attention to their work. Um, I think it's a time to feel, I would think enormously optimistic and, and determined. Um, I think that the fundamental thing that we do in theater or film is entertain. And uh, entertainment is not necessarily to, to lie or to sell pablum or to uh, make everybody feel good about everything. That's, I find that not entertaining. I find that incredibly boring and frustrating and insulting. Um, I think great tragedy is entertainment. Um, but you, know, you develop as much as you can the skills for creating work that holds an audience's attention, which is an incredibly hard thing to do. 
people will just walk out if they're really bored and they'll turn off the television. Uh, you develop those skills within yourself or in your community of artists that you're working with. And I think it's, it seems to me like a great moment when, uh, you know, I mean, I think that things have really been through tragedy and also through decades and, 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 and century or more of agitation and, and you know, um, political organizing, the world has changed substantially. It's, it's very important that while we focus our, our, our critical consciousnesses on all the things that are wrong in the world, because there are so many things that are terrible in the world, that we not in that process lose sight of what progress has been made, because if no progress has been made, there is no hope. And things have changed. I mean, you guys know this, uh, I'm 65. I've seen in my lifetime as a gay man, uh, enormous change. I, as somebody who, uh, you know, is uh, deeply invested um, in, in the civil rights movement in general and the project of, of the expanding of the American franchise of enfranchisement um, in social justice and economic justice, I've seen progress made. I'm also enormously frustrated by how little progress is made. Um, uh, there were things that drove Leonard Bernstein and Sondheim and Robbins and Lawrence to make West Side Story. Uh, um, one, I think there was a real passion, uh, uh, an anger about xenophobia and racism in the United States. That that's one of the reasons that they made the decision to make this musical about um, a white gang and, and, and a Puerto Rican community. Um, uh, a lot has changed since 1957 when they wrote it. And then there's also obviously, I don't need to tell you, so much that needs still to change. And, uh, but I think we have to keep track of what's, you know, progress is not a guarantee but when it happens, it's a mistake always to say there has been no progress, because that's just, just that's a fancy way of having despair, and despair mm -hmm. is the enemy of life. So, agreed. <laughs> um, yeah. Along those lines, um, I know that you have to go in a few minutes. I just wanted to say, um, in terms of the opportunities and bringing people to the table, have you considered? an internship or workshops for writers of color mm -hmm. that, in that way you can help broad, you know uh, widen that table what do you, you think i personally considered that uh-huh <laughs> um uh -huh. i taught playwriting uh at nyu for five years and gave it up because and this is going to sound pathetic but it's it's actually true um I have a really hard time writing. I'm a I'm a, um, a very slow writer, and I have a lot of. I'll spare you the long story of my psychopathology, but I have. I'm an insecure writer. A lot of writers are. Um, it's writing is really hard, and uh, I found that one of the reasons I stopped teaching um, is uh, that I began to feel that I was making conscious. Like if I was reading people, other people's plays a lot, I would then start writing and I would hear my editor voice talking while I was writing. And I, and I, I began to feel like this is actually making what was already enormously hard, even harder. So, um, but, uh, and, and I know that, that for instance, on West Side Story, there were internships for, for directors and for producers and, you know, to, um, and there was a lot of discussion about that and, 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 and action taken. Um, I'll think about it. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I have mentored a few writers of uh, color over the years, just people who found me and said, would you read my play? And I've, I, I try to do that, I mean, I, you know, with any young writer, um, nothing is more exciting and also more upsetting <laughs> than when some like, Jeremy O'Harris, for instance, who I think is just this kind of genius. And when I saw Slave Play, I was like, oh my God, this is so thrilling. This is like a brand new 
absolutely electrifying thing that's happening in the American theater, I also felt like, you know, okay, it's time for me to just go crawl under a rock somewhere and die because I, yeah. you know, well, I, you, you know, you, you feel competitive with the young as well as uh, excited by them. But it's, you know, you, you, if, if the world has any help, obviously we need the new voices mm -hmm. all the time and new communities that haven't had a chance to be heard from to be heard from. Yeah. So I, you know, it's, um, put you on uh, the spot. that was just a challenge for you think no, yeah, yeah. you know, right, right i'll think about it if there's any way that i could have managed just, it without wasting other people's time that's what i really you know yeah. i think it, that's my biggest advice is wasting people's time is is the thing that any playwright or screenwriter should be terrified of doing um well uh, it's it, boring people and i and i i don't want to engage people that i can't really if I can't deliver on on the promises that I've made, yeah. but I don't know. Invite me to to like do a. Uh, I'll come and do a class at Brooklyn yeah. College and we, uh, mm -hmm. on playwriting, and uh, you know I I would be. It's probably time now that I'm old. We uh, before, before before you, before you put your foot into it and and offer to teach classes at oh, Brooklyn no. College. No, no, no. Um, I, I just I I I totally. I totally differ with your opinion of your your writing uh, because I've seen you whip up something in two seconds and I came home and said, oh my God, I'll never be able to write like he writes. Uh, but stories are, the, stories are the things that bind us together. So that the more we encourage stories, personal stories, creative stories to be uh, written and to be uh, shared, uh, the better we will be as as a nation. Um, Can I add one last thing before I sign off? Um, you know, when I was working Tony, on Tony, you don't have to sign off if you want to stay on with us. <laughs> yes, we do have a few questions from the audience. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> there are questions from the audience also. Do you have okay. like five or ten sure, minutes? Absolutely. It, oh, okay. Uh, Virginia wasn't using a metaphor when she said the, the monkey was on the set, we're, we're filming a scene today with <laughs> a 27 year old capuchin monkey. So um, uh, when I was working on the, with the actors um, on West Side Story, you know, a musical doesn't have a lot of dialogue. I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, 90 minutes of the thing is taken up with the songs. And so there's a lot of backstory kind of stuff and development of, of people's histories that you could do in, in a play that doesn't have music and singing that you can't do in the book for a musical. So I, in order to keep everybody digging deep into their characters, I started writing these biographies for them and they got longer and longer right. and longer and longer. Yeah. And the longest one was for Rita Moreno who plays uh, uh, the uh, Puerto Rican widow of a Jewish uh, drugstore owner. We got rid of the character of Doc from West Side Story and replaced him with Rita's character, Valentina, which I think is a really big and positive addition and also in terms of strong women. Um, where do you see what she does? Uh, and Rita said, I want to know this woman's history. So I started writing it, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, I made her Rita's age. So the history goes all the way back. It's like a 50 page, 45 page by our single space. It's very, very our, long. It was very, very it was long. worthy of a book. <laughs> and, and, but it, it, I love doing it because I went back again to like, is, uh, you know, figuring out where in Puerto Rico was she born and how had she advanced in her years through the history of Puerto Rico, almost at the beginning of the 20th century and wound up in, in, before the 20th century began and wound up in this drugstore in the West Side in New York. And uh, Porter, I mean, I, you know, I hope this doesn't sound obnoxious that I'm saying this to you because you people are studying this, but Puerto Rican history is, you know, you, there are like 7,000 great plays and movies that could and should be made about the relationship of the United States to Puerto Rico, about Puerto Rico itself, about the intellectual, you know, hostas and Albisa uh, Campos and uh, uh, the Nueva Rican community. I mean, you know, it's 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 just, I, it's stunning how we there's this vast uh, historical epic uh, um, or treasure trove of, of, of historical material 
that needs to be that needs to be told. West Side Story is like a love story between two people, and they're sort of you know drive by looks into uh, uh, another culture. But 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 you know it would be exciting and thrilling to see that kind of you know work being done and produced and 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 it's not just for the sake of Puerto Ricans and New Ricans and and the island but also for the sake of the United States not that Puerto Rico owes the United States anything um but it would transform us uh the United States to understand what it did to Puerto Rico to understand mm -hmm. the complicated interaction between the colonizer and the colonized and the ways that the colonized often transform the colon you know it's i mean it's just a it's an astonishing i loved writing that thing for rita and and i hope that um did she use it did she, did she use it how how i, I remember the backstories but i don't know about the actors actually yeah she said she loved it um i don't know that any of the actors used it you know again uh you know, it's there's not a lot of space in the movie to use anything. I mean, I wrote right. it, every jet has one, every shark, and all the you know. Yeah. Um, I know that that Ra uh, Rachel and David Alvarez, uh, um, Rachel Zegler and David Alvarez, really they were the first two people that I wrote it for because they were the first uh, people that asked like, where where do our parents come from and and uh, and they I think really did use it. Um, they did, yes. Yeah. But, you, know, you could see it. You could see it. Actually, you could see no, them yeah. in their relationship. I think they were. I think they were useful. Yes. Um, yeah. Certainly, the digging into the politics of Puerto Rico and and New York City specifically in the 1950s, and and reminding everybody, you know, that I mean, when we got ready to do America, I mean, I talked a lot to the guys who were playing the the sharks. Um, who are a very different group than in the uh, original film, I think. I mean, I, I think I used what was there, but the Jets are a group, uh, I mean, this is one way the thing differs from Romeo and Juliet. The Jets are, in our film, um, uh, a group of sort of left behind white teenagers who are, whose parents were from, groups of immigrants that had come to the United States and then mostly moved on up the ladder and had left behind a certain, you know, um, members of their own communities that, that didn't make it and that were, you know, disorganized in various ways. So they're kind of street rats and they're violent and they're racist uh, and, and, um, and uh, a problem. The, the sharks are essentially, um, this is going to sound stupid, but it isn't. I think it works really well in the movie. I mean, the sharks have come together to protect their community from the jets. It, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's it's not cap. You know, I think the minute that Bernstein and Robbins, who were the ones, that, uh, and not Robbins, um, Arthur Lawrence and Leonard Bernstein were the ones who decided that they weren't going to make this musical about a Catholic girl and a Jewish boy in the East Side of New York. I think Arthur Lawrence was the first one who said, "What if we make it between gangs?" But the minute they did that, because they were all good liberals, they got they moved away from the Romeo and Juliet model. The the thing about the Montagues and the Capulets is that nobody can even remember why they're fighting. They're exactly identical. Um, the minute these guys decided that one gang was white and one gang was Puerto Rican, they immediately had a stake in this contest, and they kind they tried to maintain the balance to stay true to Romeo and Juliet but they kept getting thrown by it because of course they mm -hmm. believed that racism was wrong they believed that xenophobia was wrong um and and so their sympathy is is more with the sharks and there are places where I think they made mistakes and tried to make it back to sort of same side is you know good people on both sides but the the fundamental truth of West Side Story is racism is terrible and the sharks are not racist even in the original the jets are so it's not a it's not a two sides of one coin thing anymore and and we we took that and ran with it in the in the I don't want to give anything away but I mean you just 
<laughs> but, it, but as Virginia will attest, the, the opening, the prologue, the opening fight between the Jets and the Sharks is very, very different in our movie than mm -hmm. it is in mm -hmm. in the original. Um, it's a you know which side you're on almost immediately. So it's a good thing it's a long film. <laughs> but it doesn't seem long, right? No, it doesn't seem long, but it is a long film. So you got a lot more that you didn't talk about. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, that's one excellent. of the audience members uh, yeah. said that uh, Dr. Ernesto Acevedo Munoz, who's our next speaker on October 13th, uh, and who worked on the film, um, I saw, he says, I saw the movie on August 19th and noticed that the America lyrics were closer to the 1961 movie than the 1957 Broadway show. Yeah. Can you say something about that, how that decision came about, given that the early press suggested that the new movie was going to be closer to the original Broadway show? Well, the, the movie is closer to the original Broadway show in that um, when I started, uh, I grew up with, I mean, I don't think I, I was a little kid when the 61 movie came out. I was like five years old. Uh, so I, I didn't see it then. I don't think I saw it till college but we had the original cast album from the Broadway show in our house and we listened to it all the time. So I kind of went back to that, like that was sort of my Bible. And um, the order of the songs is very different in the original Broadway musical. And I think it's more interesting. I think it's very um, daring. For instance, I Feel Pretty is the top of the second act after the rumble. Mm -hmm. So while Maria is singing, I Feel Pretty, the audience knows something that she doesn't know, which is that her life is over. Her lover has killed her brother and she doesn't know that yet. And that song, which is I think a magnificent song, becomes almost unbearably uh, poignant and terrible when you're watching this woman give this incredible expression of joy at having fallen <laughs> in love. And you know that sh she's about to learn that she's gonna go from the height of joy to the depths of despair. And I think that that was a brave and shocking thing that they did. In the Hollywood movie, they decided oh, we can't do that. So they switched it around and moved it. And by moving I Feel Pretty, they had to switch a whole bunch of other things around. I won't go into all of it. Yeah. But in that regard, we followed, I was much more guided by the order of the original uh, musical than by the film. When the, uh, as I understand it, um, when uh, the musical uh, first came out on Broadway, um, while Virginia's right, there was a, a great deal of um, excitement in the Norwegian community um, and in the uh, Latino community across the United States that there was uh, the, uh, the Spanish speaking characters were, were being represented finally. Um, a lot of Puerto Ricans were very critical of the lyrics of America because in the original, in the Broadway version, the, the lyrics were basically, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a debate between two women and, and the, the main point of it was that Puerto Rico is a terrible, awful, pestilential place and why would anybody want to go back there? Um, there was a lot of criticism of it and some of it clearly reached Sondheim, uh, because he changed the lyrics of the movie and he made it not about, uh, um, you know, sort of the terrible thing of Puerto Rico, but about two different views of living in New York. The, the guys are saying New York is a racist, horrible place and we're sick of it. And the women are saying there's a lot of opportunity here. So they, they, they tried to make an adjustment. Um, and, and I think it's in some ways a successful adjustment. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's less problematic uh, than the original um, song. I think that their intention was honorable when they wrote the original lyrics. They're, they were all Jews. So they just assumed that, I mean, it's not clear to me whether they knew that Puerto Ricans are not immigrants. There's a, there's a lyric in the original song that goes, uh, um, Immigrant goes to America, many hellos in America, nobody knows in America, Puerto Rico's in America, uh, which is an odd, odd lyric because it starts off by suggesting that somebody from Puerto Rico uh, coming to the United States is an immigrant, but it ends by saying that they're not, that Puerto Rico is part of the United States. So it's, a, it's not clear to me what they knew and what they didn't 
know. But um, we decided to use the um, the lyrics from the film, uh, 61 film, because they were, um, you know, uh, what I was gonna say is Jew for Jewish people coming from Russia and from a land of pogroms and, and horrendous persecution, we had no attachment at all to, to the old country. Jews in the United States were very fond of saying, you know, let it sink into the ocean. Who needs it? You mm -hmm. know, we cursed it. It was a terrible place. Uh, obviously, that's not the relationship that Puerto Ricans moving to New York had with Puerto Rico. Um, and they made a mistake. They, they, in that instance, they didn't imagine the other correctly. Um, mm -hmm. We felt that they, Sondheim, you know, is a very politically progressive guy made a real effort to make it better in, in the movie, and he did, but the introduction to the movie is nastier about Puerto Rico than the introduction in the stage play. So we sort of used, it's a little bit of a hybrid. We took lyrics from the stage yeah. play for the introduction, and so you'll see. I think yeah. it works. I, I, think uh, it, I think it works, and I think people will, I think that number is astonishing in our movie, and I think people will love it. I, I just want to make one comment that if there have been any spoiler alerts, I hope they just serve to get you to go and see the movie when it comes out. And my other comment is that the comments coming in from the uh, from the audience are fantastic. I hope that there is some way that we could get those to you uh, because they are full discussions based on, on, on what you've been saying. Right. And, uh, and they're really, really very, very rich in, in, in commentary. I, I don't know how we do yes, that, Maria. You can do that, that's easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, so that, uh, so that, uh, that Tony will know exactly what's going on. Yeah. I wish we could see the audience. I wish we were in a, I would in love a, to, in I, I'm sorry that this is happening before the movie has come out because I also feel like it's hard talking about what we, you know, I would love to know what people think. So maybe we'll do this again after the yes. movie's come out. People have gotten a that chance. That would be great. Because it's hard to discuss it in the abstract. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so. Actually, one of the things that, uh, that, that Maria had planned in the course was to have the students see the new movie, uh, the new version, so that they could compare it to everything that they've been learning throughout the semester. If there is some way that they could do that uh, to to have access to the to to the movie uh, or yeah, that, that, or passes or uh, whatever, you know, there there, yeah, there aren't yeah. that many students in the class. Uh, but um, at least in our class, there are some classes decision, that are tuning in. If, if I had it was my decision, I you could say, do it immediately. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it would be. We'll see, we'll see what we can come up with. This is where you realize your yeah. limitation. Your yeah. limited writer. Uh, nobody cares what I think about that. Um, but it's it, it will be out and available soon, and I hope. You know. mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. And on that note, uh, we'd like to thank you very much, Mr. Tony Kushner, for oh, giving up your time and your, um, you know, your work and, and your creativity and your inspiration. And so uh, we hope to bring you back soon after the film. That would be great. Anytime. Um, <laughs> I, I would really love to. This, this exchange has been wonderful for me as well. So yeah. I, I'm sorry it has to be uh, cut short, but but yeah, let's do, let's let's figure out it. Let's meet okay. again. We'll do all something. Right. Thank Great. you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Goodbye.